Welcome everyone to series nine. It's just me today giving Ryan a break this week. I'm really excited. We are covering Spire for this series, and we were really lucky to be able to sit down and talk with Grant Howitt, one of the designers of the game. I want to say a huge thank you to Grant, who stayed up until 3 a.m. recording with us and was still a joy to talk to. The Kickstarter for Strata, a source book for this game, will be kickstarting later this month, and we will be sure to share a link with you when it's available. International Podcast Month just wrapped up. Ryan has two more episodes that just released on Saturday, so you can check those out along with all of the great stuff from the past month over at internationalpodcastmonth.com and on the I Am Here, that's H-E-A-R, podcast feed. Speaking of I Am Here, both that show and ours, along with many other great RPG podcasts, were recently featured in an article over on Polygon.com. We'll put a link to that in the show notes if anyone wants to check out some of the other recommended shows. But if you're new to our show after finding us through that article, welcome! We're really excited to show you what we can do. Network Overlord James D'Amato's book comes out tomorrow. The Ultimate RPG Character Backstory Guide is a book of exercises and prompts to help you create amazing RPG characters, which is something we are pretty sure will appeal to people who love our show. You can order it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, pretty much anywhere you can get books, or you can check with your local bookstore, see if they have it in stock or if they will order it for you. One last note before we finally let you get to the show. The release of this episode marks the six-month anniversary of our show. It has been an exciting, amazing, and inspiring experience getting to make this show and getting to interact with all of these amazing people in the RPG community. Thank you so much to all of you for your feedback, your encouragement, and most of all, for your time. So with all of that out of the way, I will not waste any more of it. Let's get to the episode. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode my co-host Amelia and I welcome Grant Howitt, one of the designers of the game we are discussing today, Spire, a dark fantasy role-playing game from Rowan, Rook, and Deckard, as well as the upcoming Kickstarter for Strata, a Spire sourcebook. Grant, welcome to Character Creation Cast. We're really excited that you could join us. I'm excited to be here. I'm, uh, I'm, I, I like creating characters. I often do it for games I'm not even playing in. So this is quite, uh, this is quite a thrill. That's what our whole podcast is about. Characters mm. we will never have to play or suffer the consequences <laughs> of. Ca- characters that don't get that sort of dirty game all over them. You can keep them perfect and pure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to start by introducing yourself to our audience yes. and tell us what you have going on? Uh, my name is Grant Howitt. You uh, may know me from Twitter. That's probably the easiest place to find me. Um, I've uh, bet- uh, So I-, I should also note, Chris Taylor is the co-author on this and all of my other products. Unfortunately, he's under the weather, couldn't make it tonight. Uh, so I am having to be twice as charismatic for both of us, <laughs> but I'll do what I can. Uh, we have written uh, Spire, which uh, Ryan mentioned earlier. We've also got things like Honey Heist, which is a game where you play criminal bears. Uh, Goblin Quest, where you play five goblins each who all die. Oh. Um, <laughs> One Last Job, where you tell you create your characters entirely through flashbacks. And Jason Statham's Big Vacation, where you have to make sure that Jason Statham has a nice holiday. <laughs> That's amazing. It's a, it's a very, it's a very high concept work. We, I'm playing Spire with a group of friends right now, and one person did not know that you were also the author of Honey Heist, Mm. and that, like, blew her mind that you would make this game and that game. (laughs) Like, I don't know how those come from the same person. (laughs) (laughs) 
that's that's fair. Yeah. Um, so uh, I release uh, a single one-page game every month through my Patreon, which is really good for keeping my hand in and sort of staying vaguely present on the scene, uh, rather than just releasing one big book every eighteen months. And because I've got one page, I can afford to do stupid things like Honey Heist or um, what was the last one I released? Pride and Extreme Prejudice, where you yeah. play um, ladies of marriage, ladies of a marriageable age in their giant robot. Oh, yeah, they're they're real good games. They're real good games. That's amazing. <laughs> they're solid ideas. I'll give it yeah. that. <laughs> you know what? You have the courage to put those down on paper and let other people look at them. So yes, true, true <laughs> that. I'm, where the rest I'm, of us I are am, like, mm, I don't know. I'm, I'm c- courageous is a word I'd use to describe myself, certainly for writing games about bears. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. No worries. Yeah, uh, let's go ahead and get into this, and we can start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? Okay, so, Spire, and I will give you my official pitch, what I give to people when I try and sell them the game when they come up to my stall at a convention. <laughs> so Spire is a game of fantasy rebellion and insurrection. You play dark elves in a mile high city that's so tall and so complex that reality has started to go off in the middle like old milk. About 200 years ago, the Elfir or high elves invaded and they took it over and they graciously allowed the dark elves to live in Spire uh, in exchange for basically being indentured servants and living as an underclass. And so the player characters have joined the ministry of our hidden mistress, a forbidden religion, mm-hmm. and they are effectively a terrorist organization um, fighting against the evils of the of the oppressive government. It's grim, and but not without humor. I think there's definitely yeah. there's definitely points of points of light and uh, moments of hope amidst amidst all of the uh, arms coming off and people having to sell their families <laughs> for beer money. Goodness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say that's so far in playing it. That's been my favorite thing about it is that we have had some really weird and very silly moments, and mm-hmm. then it will kind of turn a corner and it'll be very dark. Um, yeah. It's it's a little bit of emotional whiplash, and mm. I kind of love it. You want to get an emotional neck brace for Spire, certainly. Yes. <laughs> there's, 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 there's a game called uh, Monkey Drome, I think. Or mo- yes, something along those lines. Um, it was in Swords of That Master, I believe, what, what, one of the issues. And the like. It's, it's a very basic mechanic, and mechanic one is you have to tell a joke, and mechanic two is you have to do ultraviolence, and you just flop back and forth between them. Oh my them. gosh, that's so good! <laughs> and it's just, oh, okay. Oh, oh. You, you just cut to the chase, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we've gone for a little something like that with Spire. We're very keen on having violence uh, with full ramifications in that it's effective, but also disgusting. Mm. Mm. One of the things that really interests me about this game is that the setting information in this book, which is not terribly huge um, mm. as RPG rule books go, um, there's a lot of information about Spire. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, I mean, you have like the rules for a card game that nobody really knows the rules for. Um, so, <laughs> and, you know, just like, <laughs> oh, is there another one? I feel like I maybe missed that one. Uh, there's, there's a fortune telling game, which is basically Gwent from The Witcher. Oh, gosh. Oh, that's that so crops good. up later in the book. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Uh, no, there's just, I mean, you have like the names of clubs and casinos and all kinds of stuff just written in there already. Um, mm. Was that like, how long did that take to come up with all of that? Um, so Chris and I work really well together. Um, and we had, like, thankfully, because we're not working for a publisher, we're just working for ourselves, we were able to just take as long as we needed, basically, up until we had the Kickstarter deadline weighing down on us. But we have um, a, uh, a mate of mine on Twitter described Chris and, um, uh, Chris and my's writing style as, what was it, um, Ideas Boss Rush. <laughs> <laughs> which you just have a load of ideas like go 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 and that's that's tremendously good fun to write for because like we didn't like we were really not interested in talking about what happened in the past we wanted to have like a paragraph or two establishing uh, okay this is why things are like that are the, the, the way they are now but we were far more interested in setting up what might happen tomorrow and so that was like giving P- giving people who are fallible places which you can um, take over or destroy or what have you. Um, it's We'd much rather just sketch out something very lightly and give give the name of a casino and something interesting about it and then just pretend that it exists 
and then it does exist because like there's it's it's interesting people ask about spire and 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 they'll be like oh uh, one of the powers uh, for the for one of the classes mentions understanding all languages what languages are there in spire i do not know no i haven't a clue what languages there <laughs> all are all of them all, all of them. them yes many <laughs> um but if your player takes that power as a GM, you're like, cool. Well, they want the game to be about languages, I guess. So I, I, I best I'd start. I guess I'd better start coming up with some. And so, like, we wanted to give the ability for the GM and the players to look at what parts of the world they wanted, and also, crucially, one of the things we we're really careful with with Spire is to make a setting which is really dense and really fruity, like a good Christmas cake, but not too, but not one which people will be like, oh, I have to learn the whole thing before I play. Like, we want people to make it up, we want people to change it, and we work that into the mechanics of the game. It's like, your version of Spire will not be the same as my version of Spire, and we've written it with that in mind. That's really cool. It's It's basically, you've got all of this detail, but it's still pretty much open world. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, I like that about it because it feels like there's enough of a framework because I think that sometimes when things are too open, it's really hard to even know where to start and you get sort of like paralyzed with indecision. And so I like when there's enough of a framework to work within, but not so much that like you have such a meta plot that you can't interact with anything because you will mess it up. Having the uh, having the ministry as the core player identity was really useful because we know what the games are going to be about. In as much as like we 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 can envisage uh, certain, if not ex- the exact player actions, but certain kinds of player actions, which has made it really easy is the wrong word, but interesting to write adventures and campaign frames for Spire. In that we don't write out scenes; we have NPCs and we have things like things that we might like to happen, and then basically the GM's job job is to take those NPCs and sort of make them kiss like dolls. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How interesting! And you just you just <laughs> put the players around that. Um, it's an, a, a, an important tenet of most of my games is at least sixty percent of your NPC should be extremely kissable. Oh, yeah. absolutely! And yeah. all games should have shopping scenes. Those oh, are like God, the yeah. two yes. things. Yes. Yeah. Um, our, hats, our first ideally. game of it had like a solid half hour of us picking out outfits, and I was like, "This is Brilliant. a good game." This is yeah, how it's 100%. supposed to go. <laughs> yeah. There are... Oh, actually, I just, I just realized I don't have a thing on fashions. I need to... I'm just going to put a note in. I haven't written about Spire fashions yet. I'm an <gasps> idiot. Please do that. That will be an excellent <laughs> addition to Strata. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Which, oh yes, which I should mention. Yes. Actually. Well, that was like my, that was my next question here. So because there's so much in here already, what else are you doing? What are we doing? So Strata is our first proper source book for the game we had uh black magic which had had a, a bunch of more occult rules and stuff like and the so rules for playing a blood witch uh, who have kind of a magical blood disease but it was not so setting heavy we you know uh, what's important to us is to communicate that setting through rules rather than just sit down and say all right everyone here's a comprehension test we'd much rather communicate it to you through rules but that's not always possible um so in strata we're focusing on the highest and lowest echelons of society um, so the poorest districts, like the Undercity, uh, Derelictus, uh, Perch, which is nailed to the side of Spire, as well as shanty towns, uh, where the people worship small gods and their weapons and armor, uh, <laughs> and the high society elements, so like Amaranth, which is permanently frozen by weird high elf magic, and the Silver Quarter, which is fantasy Las Vegas crossed with fantasy Venice, oh. um, and we've taken the basically we we cut we we cut something from every chapter in the game and we've taken these ideas and developed more onto them and thought about well if we're setting games in this area what's the tension what's the rub what can players see um and in addition to that and and, and so like we've got rules it's not just oh here's here's some fun ideas for things but like we have uh, there's a character class called the idol who is a bleeding edge artist and uh, cultist and we have different um abilities depending on which school of art they're following within the Ivory Collective, in, like, Shadow Magic, and, um, what's, what's, what's the one? Antitropolonismancy. There we oh, go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who believe the Spire is the ugliest thing in the world. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, but aside from that, we've, um, we've also, uh, we've hired, um, nine other authors oh, to, cool. do adve- to do adventures for us. 
Uh, mm-hmm. And so, like we we've had an incredible response from the community, um, the, which which is which has grown up around Spire. We've got a nice Discord, uh, and it's really lovely hearing people playing their games and like hearing people write back to us. And so, what we wanted to do was give give people the opportunity within our community and outside that to take Spire and expand upon it and take oh well, what about idea X and idea Y? We push them together. What happens? What happens when this faction fights this faction? And so we put out an open call for writers about three months ago, I think, and just said, if you have an idea, give us a pitch in 100 words or fewer. And we got about 120, I think, about 100. And we're publishing nine of them, which is really cool. Well, we're we're publishing four of them, and then we have stretch goals. (laughs) Um, So you'll publish nine of them, don't worry. Yeah, for sure. It'll be fine. Uh, Hopefully... (laughs) Hopefully we should do well, but we've got like we've got a we've got really fantastic set. We've got a uh, Kira McGran is doing a is, is doing one of our stretch goals. She wrote um, this wonderful game about about lesbian snakes bedding down for winter. Uh, we've I've got heard um, we've got uh, Helen Gould is doing so. Helen Gould did one of the uh, settings for Cthulhu Dark. Okay. Um, okay. She is doing effectively Downton Abbey, but oh, all so the good. posh people are. Un- uh, undead elves and all of the servants are ministry agents who've snuck in to try and overthrow one house. And it's oh, just, wow. yeah, it's really cool. We've got uh, one about running an illegal newspaper, uh, one about rescuing artistic surgery victims, one about being kicked out of effectively Kowloon Walled City and fighting the eviction notice. There's so many <laughs> cool things. Oh, this sounds so good. Oh, and we have two new classes, and one of them's a journalist. Oh, there you go. This is oh, so nice. good. Oh, I'm so excited. Very for nice. This. So I feel like I heard that there's an SRD too. Yes, um, that should be out um, now. Honestly, uh, we're waiting for the final round of corrections to go through from our, on our designer. Uh, there's a few tweaks, but we've got the SRD done for so the core system. We're calling it the resistance system because mm-hmm. Spire, as hopefully people will learn as, they, as we go through the podcast, um, relies on resistances. And characters accrue stress those resistances, and then that solidifies into fallout, and that's where story happens. We wanted, right. basically, mm-hmm. we wanted to reward people for getting injured and getting in trouble because that's fun story, rather than punish them by giving them harder roles. Um, and so we 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 done a lot of thinking about it, and basically, you can do a great deal with the system by changing what those res- what those resistances are, what those skills are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, w- what's been really fun is in the SRD just writing up, say, a list of Fallout from a setting which does not exist, and and referencing resistances which do not exist, and like <laughs> building dummy rules around it. So that, that's that's been good fun, and hopefully that should be out. Uh, bef- that will be out before the Kickstarter launches. That's awesome. Oh, very cool. I love the idea of like taking those fallouts and then like building your setting out from there. Mm. Like I feel like that's a really good way to start. Mm. Be so cool. <laughs> oh, I'm very excited for this. Mm-hmm. And uh, before we get into uh, more things, what sort of things do we need to play this game? What sort of materials do we need? Uh, you will need pencil and paper and a 4D10, a D8 and a D6. Very simple. I, I believe um, that's about it, really. Also, like traditionally, the GM takes track of everyone's, uh, keeps track of everyone's fallout and stress. Uh, because oh, it's interesting. More, it's a bit more exciting that way. We find, and it's slightly easier to do some of the mechanics. Uh, is it, is, that. So, is sorry? that something where it's basically hidden to the players at that point, or? Um, it's yeah, it's it's occluded certainly. Like they can ask if there's some sort of mechanic which relies on them having X number of stress. Then you know you you can inform them. But generally, like rather than saying, "Oh, you take three blood stress," it's more, "Oh, your head's spinning and you can feel your teeth ringing." Ooh. That sort of thing. Oh, that you can taste tin in your mouth. Uh, it's a trick we learned from unknown armies. Ooh. Um, I I very much think uh that. Seeing that Spire is the game we wrote because we weren't allowed to write the new edition of Unknown Armies. <laughs> <laughs> How rude of them. I know. I mean, I, d- I didn't apply, but still, they should have come around. <laughs> <laughs> they should have called you. Did they not know? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's rude. We've talked a little bit about it already, um, but one of our questions that we like to start with is, what do characters do in this game? So in mm. D&D, you start with an adventuring party. In Masks, you have a team of superheroes. Like, what is the core of what your characters are going to be doing in a game of Spire? You'll be fighting the power, I think, is the um, is the core idea. The So the title is, uh, the subtitle is Spire, the City Must Fall, um, which is, which was a last minute edition because it looked good on the cover. <laughs> and basically, the players will be leading or creating a rebellion in some way. They'll be trying to overthrow the government. Uh, that's the ideal high-level um, 
result. Generally, it's done on a more small scale. And so though they'll be assassinating and then replacing uh, government officials with useful patsies, or they'll be um, taking back control of a district or eliminating a particular problem in some way. But it's either it's either a grassroots rebellion, which, which happens slowly, or some sort of full violent riot. I'm going to say one in two Spire games ends in a district-wide riot. Uh, but oh. that might just be because we like them. <laughs> I'm all for rioting. Rioting is never the wrong choice. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's the spirit. Oh, and also, you'll be hiding from the police a lot. The other thing is that you're not allowed to do what you're doing, obviously, because you're running a rebellion. The things like certain character, like most of your weapons, you can't carry out on the street legally. It's not like D and D where things, oh, you can't bring that massive death killer sword into the pub. You'll have to leave <laughs> it outside. It's like you'll be arrested and thrown in jail, that sort of thing. So there's a great deal of secrecy and just like the act of getting a gun somewhere is itself a, a mission, a story. Wow. So, uh, aside from this game being completely tailored to Amelia, um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you say uh, is unique about uh, Spire, uh, aside from you know, a few things that we have talked about already? Well, okay. I mean, there's the resistances, as we mentioned earlier, so the game is focused around what you have to lose. I think that's the... like We, we basically wrote a game where it's the same mechanics for losing hit points as it is for losing money as it is for losing reputation as it is for getting in debt etc etc mm -hmm. uh, i think the other thing as well is um i don't know a lot of people are like oh well our game is unique oh, most games are unique because people have written them and messed around with it like and our game certainly it's what well, one thing which we wanted to do was give the drow a fair go mm -hmm. in that they've not been really they've they've had to put it mildly a problematic history in Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. and so we wanted to establish them as people, and so like being able to have the Drower people and the High Elves, the ones which like traditionally the humans interact with and who bestow knowledge, are weird and alien and strange, um, mm -hmm. and are uh, and, and that's, that's the thing. Like it's everything's propaganda. No matter what you write, it, it 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 is going to reflect your views in some way, and so this is written as a propaganda piece from the Drow saying, oh, the elf here are cruel and evil and the elf here are strange and they have to take drugs to feel sad, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, and they might just be, you know, your standard occupying force. Um, and there's plenty of wiggle room to how you want to play that, but primarily mm -hmm. we wanted to make some interesting draw. Very cool. So normally at this point, we go and look up a Wikipedia article and talk about the history of the game. But uh -huh. you're here, so we can make you do that. Yes. Gods. I'd really like a Wikipedia article at some point. I'm looking forward to it. That'd all right. Great. Well, maybe after this chat, I can go write one because I'll have all the information. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to know, like, how long has this game been around? How long has the idea been around? Like, how did this Oof. happen? Okay. Um, all of it. So, okay, all of it. Um, I'll, I'll do my best <laughs> to summarize as, as quickly as possible. Um the idea for Spire arose... Uh, so I used to play Dark Heresy. I used to run Dark Heresy, uh, the Warhammer 40,000 game. I really okay. like the ideas behind Dark Heresy. I love the setting. The mechanics leave a little something to be desired, in my opinion, like success. I desire success and it does not happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and they're very like they're, they're very complicated and they suffer from rules creep as you go through the different, you know, Rogue Trader, Black Crusade, etc., etc. But I ran a couple of campaigns of, of uh, Dark Heresy and really liked it. And what I was interested in doing was was writing a spy game of some kind in which you manipulated assets and so like and because dark heresy is a spy game it just doesn't really have the rules to do it and so i wanted to have like oh i've made this connection and i can burn this asset i can um i can risk this asset that sort of thing and that was oh sir, five years ago i had the yeah. idea and that went through a couple of iterations and never got anywhere and then i was like hang on a sec i can't write this game because games workshop will sue me so I was like, okay, well, what if we had Dark Elves who were secret police for the High Elves and some sort of caste system? And I had this sort of daft game with lots of different playing cards, which you you had playing cards and you sort of built up the city around them. Still got the notes somewhere in a big A3. I used to work on A3 bits of paper before I used Google Docs. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so that then very quickly just got pushed to the side and I forgot about it. Um, and then... We uh, And so uh, we had a Kickstarter for Goblin Quest, uh, which is the daft one. We had a Kickstarter for a game called Unbound, which is a universal role-playing game, which are, as it turns out, impossible to sell. 
uh, because you're not allowed <laughs> to discuss the setting. Uh, it's it's pretty good. I'm bound. I'm pretty. I'm pretty proud of it. But it, is, it sounded um, super cool. Like that's so. That's how I first heard about you was because you were on uh, um, talking tabletop with Jim McClure. Oh, and, yeah. Like that game sounded so cool, and then I missed the Kickstarter by the time yeah. I listened to the episode. <laughs> it's um. It's 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 really neat and like Unbound did um world creation and player creation and character creation and plot creation and enemy creation all at the same time and so you get this fantastic session zero. Really proud of that. Oh nice. Um but unfortunately we couldn't sell it because you have to say, Well, people are asking you, what sort of games can I play? And we're like, uh, All of them? Like, all of them? <laughs> Anything you can imagine. Give us which, some money. I mean, which is really in- interesting to me, though, because, like, there are, there are plenty of generic systems out there. Like, you mm-hmm. have GURPS, and you have, um, like, Fantasy Flight just did Genesis, and, yeah. you know... Like it's not like a thing people don't want. I think I think it's it's not a thing people don't want. I think that it was difficult to find the new one in the market to, to sort of, mm. to sort of break into the market because Fate's already doing story, uh, Genesis is already doing um, weirdo dice, GURPS is already doing the sort of people who fetishize calculators. That sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, thank you. I yeah. thank you. I appreciate just, that. Just, take. just put, it's putting a little gingham dress on a calculator and take it out for a picnic. <laughs> and it's and Unbound was story focused, um, snacky combat, um, lots of pushes and pulls, and like was heavily inspired by um, MMO mechanics, honestly, and that sort of thing. So like big boss battles and like using fight tactics and that sort of thing. <laughs> um, it we we were still finding our feet. It sold okay. We didn't work out how to sell it. There wasn't a community. We well, what, the community didn't spring up around it, and we didn't curate one. Um, but then um, I was getting into releasing uh, one-page games, and we decided that if we wanted to make a proper go of this, we had to have a proper game. And we had to do something which would sell and which would have a big book attached to it and which we could really stretch our legs. And so uh, the original title the original title of Spire was Spindle, uh, oh. which I'm glad we changed. Um, and the... Uh, and like. I just, I, again, I was on a bit of A3 paper and I was sort of drawing it, drawing it and like drawing a big spire and drawing a, an elf with cool sunglasses on. I was like, dark elves <laughs> must wear cool sunglasses and hats. And, um, and so it became, it, this sort of spy game arose out of that again. And I just had the core ideas. And that was when I brought Chris in. We'd worked together on, um, Unbound in the past. And he, and like, we, we were basically both looking for a job and we'd be like, could we, could we do this for a job? We make this happen, <laughs> and so the pair of us did a scant seventeen iterations of the rules. Oh, um, just so many different versions of the rules before we got to the current one, and we didn't even playtest most of them. Like, well, like we'd we'd write up most of a version of the rules and go, "How does defense work?" Oh, it's easy. You just oh, we oh, we have to do the whole thing again, aren't we? And, <laughs> and then we just throw out most of what we, so that's the thing like we we ended up throwing out a lot of the mechanics but keeping the fluff and the uh the fiction the world build built up and percolated around the mm-hmm. rules and then what then what we started doing was creating rules which would, which would help us tell that story and then we ended up on iteration 17 which was a d10 pool system uh iteration 16 was a d20 system uh which we narrowly missed um, oh. Ooh, that was close. Yeah, close one, close one. Honestly, <laughs> it was not ideal. Um, and this, and 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 so the final, the, the final version we have is very um, rules light. Isn't quite the word because there's quite a lot of rules in the book, but they're more um, they're more character rules in that they're powers you can have or ways in which you break reality. The core idea is basically there's a paragraph of text which explains everything you ha- everything you need to do in the game. You, mm-hmm. you roll you roll the dice and consult a table, and that's how the game works. <laughs> yeah, it feels really clean is mm. the word that I would use. Um, Thank you. I don't think that I've ever picked up a system that quickly because I'm mm. one of those people that like I can read a rule book and then I go, okay, I, don't, I have no idea how to play this game <laughs> still. Um, I need to actually do it. And yeah. so I played it at Gen Con and we had a very short like mm. two hour game. Um, it's Dylan ran a game, didn't he? St- what? Yes, Dylan ran exactly. Game. That's yeah. Um, I like Dylan very much. He was in. A, he, he was in the first playtest. I oh. thought about asking him if he wanted to do this tonight, and then I ran out of time, and then it was time to record. <laughs> I was going to like see if last minute he wanted to join us. Um, but yeah, he ran a game for us, and it was very silly. But it was like probably the quickest I've ever picked up rules to a game, mm. and still have not really read the rules section of the book. I've read some of the that's, other stuff, yeah, um, that's but fair. I've played it like three or four times now. So, mm. like, I'm doing fine, it, I think. The what? Yeah, I mean, the, the way Chris and I approach games is that um, we never read the full rule book. We never, and like, we we don't want to sit down and do comprehension. So, like, 
much like we didn't want people to have to learn the setting, we want people to get a rough overview of the rules and then just wing it. Because that's how people actually run games. Yep. Rather than, like, r- rather than, oh, actually, stop. Let me consult the rules. Like, generally, you're about three glasses of wine in. You don't really care about that. You just want to tell the story. And so we <laughs> wanted to make a game which would just let us do that. Which is, yeah, it's perfect. Because I think it was probably like an hour into our game and our GM was like, okay, I need you to roll. And I was like, oh, right, we're playing a game. I remember that now. Because <laughs> um, they're just having fun, like goofing around mm. and, you know, petting a hyena. Yeah. Like you do. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so can we go over some basic terms and concepts that we'll need you to know indeed. before we create the characters? Um, we have a list. Yeah, yeah, this is my list of things that I thought maybe people might need to know. So if you we have, have anything we, else, we have an you updated add? list. <gasps> yeah, we have. Um, yeah, the uh, the the missing creator, uh, Chris, and I went through went through your notes today. Your 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 incredibly detailed notes. And, Thank you. And Chris, unfortunately, again, a little bit ill, but was well enough this afternoon to go through with me and write and write intelligent answers to all of your questions. <laughs> Some basic terms and concepts used in Spire. Um, skills are a doing actions. So they're things like uh, sneak or steal or fight. Uh, we have a list of nine and they're all very straightforward. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, you, if you have the skill, you add a d10 to your pool when you do the thing. They're binary on off. Uh, domains are similar to skills, but much broader. So domains are, are related to areas of the city or areas of knowledge or certain kinds of people. So, for example, a cult is a domain, but also low society is a domain um, and technology is a domain. And you will you if you have access to a skill and access to a, access to a relevant domain, you can use both on a relevant check. Uh, knacks are if you get a skill or domain you already have um, they are another word for specialties they're just specialties from World of Darkness and we didn't want to use the same word so they're knacks you can roll an extra d10 when you do the thing if, you're, if you've got this one specific thing you're good at um, other things which, you, which we need to mention durances, so your durance is how you served under the Elphir um, or High Elves uh, and that's uh, we've, we've we've got a big list of those at the, at the start of the character creation, and that gives you a little bit of history and a few extra stats and skills. Um, bonds are your relationship with PCs and NPCs, which are and, the, and our relationship together as PCs is a very is it's a big beefy bit of character creation, working out how we sync up in that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, finally, abilities is everything that a character can have that isn't that. Uh, is, isn't anything else. <laughs> so all of your advances, all your character options, all your spells, all your um, special rules tweaks, they're all classed as abilities. And that, I think, is all the terms you need to know. Do we want... I didn't put resistances on the list, but do we want oh, to kind of explain those a little bit? Yes, we should. Thank you. They're crucial. <laughs> um, so uh, resistances are, as as mentioned previously, they are things you have to lose. And in Spire, we have five resistances, which are, see if I can get them in the right order, blood, mind, silver, rep, reputation, and shadow. Um, Blood is physical damage and exhaustion. Mind is um, sanity, stability, madness. Uh, Silver is how much money you have. It's it's more of a cash flow thing, credit rating, than actually, you know, Mm. pocket pocket full of gold. Uh, reputation is your overall social standing in Spire, and Shadow is how close the secret police are to kicking your door and shooting you in the street. Very and, interesting. Uh, uh, characters will have certain what we call free slots and resistances. Um, so I've just got, I've got the book open in front of me here, and the bound has blood plus one, shadow plus two. And what this means is they have these two free slots which they can allocate stress to, and it doesn't count towards their total stress when working out if any of those, if, if their stress develops into a fallout which has definite story ramifications. Okay. I think that's us. I think that's most of it. Glorious. Shall we make some people? Yeah, let's, let's make, some, make people. some people. Let's make some people. So, what have either of you got any ideas about the sort of thing you like to play? Uh yeah, I've I've got some ideas. I was looking through mm-hmm. the book earlier today and uh, was uh, drumming up some ideas. Okay, what you got? Uh, let's see, pulling up my notes. You want to do the bound? Yeah, I kind of do. 
I know you don't want me to be right, but you do. I yeah. just I just finished writing the bound section for Strother today as well. We, we, we've got a list of uh, so the the bound are vigilantes who um, uh, worship the gods in their clothes and their ropes and their armor, but um, their blades they have to find a different god and imprison it imprison it inside the blade. And so we, like we just I, I just finished writing today a list of gods and the blades that that, that imprison them in Spire. Oh, that's so cool! She's gonna, <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited! It, it just writes itself. It's really oh, nice. that's so good. <laughs> Yeah, you had me at vigilante, so yeah, they are that. They're, we they also they have um, trademark uh, red binding ropes they wear around them, so their their nickname in playtest was Shibari Batman. Nice, perfect. That is awesome. Okay, okay so before we uh, before we start selecting all okay. of our stuff, what is the first thing that we would need to do uh, when we want to start creating a character in Spire? You would pick up your class first. That's the that's the most okay. important thing. So there are. I... I think nine classes in the book. I haven't actually counted them. Nine-ish classes in the book, um, and that they they inform your um, your role in the party, your skill list, your abilities, that sort of thing. So okay. they're definitely the most important thing to pick out. In terms of striking a balance and that sort of thing, um, we don't necessarily have much of a like. You don't need a tank, a healer, a rogue, a wizard, that sort of thing. It's much broader, but. If one of you is playing someone who's fascinated with high society and infiltrating Elphir parties, and one of you is playing a heretic god of uh, a heretic worshipper of a god of death who has a slavering hyena chained to their wrist, then there might be some difficulty <laughs> bringing those together as the GM. Mm-hmm. But you know, it, it it can work. I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it happen. You can figure it out. Opposites yeah. attract. So. Mm. so, so usually we let our guests pick first. Do you know mm. what you want to do? Um, I was going to let you pick first. Okay. <laughs> it's perfectly fine to pass. Uh, yes, I will pass. Actually, I'm. 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 I'm gonna. I'm gonna pick something which complements your two choices. Wonderful. All right. So Ryan, you're gonna do the bound. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna be sticking with the bound. Um, I saw a couple other ones that uh, were kind of piquing my interest, but the the type of character I'm looking to make this time, the bound fits a lot better. So normally I would pick the Vermissing Sage. But I'm not going to do that because that's what I'm playing in the other game. Okay. So um, I'm going to have to like not pick a nerd character. I don't know how I'm going to do that. Any character can be a nerd if you believe hard enough. Yeah. I kind of want to do the Carrion Priest. That were, uh, so, so I was thinking about doing Knight. Ooh, um, perfect. And so I think like this gives us kind of a low society party, which works quite well. I can see this. Um, I see us hanging out in the bottom end of Spire. But um, the Bound is sneaky. The Carrion Priest is anything but sneaky. Because uh, they have a big hyena, and mm-hmm. the knight is even less sneaky than that. So I kind of like the idea of a slight group of misfits. That works for me. I like that. I like All right. That. So. So we have picked out our character types. Mm-hmm. We have our paper. We're not making a ton of noise with our papers. Oh, I've got I've got notes that I'm typing. So. Oh. So you have clicky keyboard sounds instead. Yeah, I have a clickety keyboard. Sorry, yeah. I, I did. I didn't want to print anything because it's um. Half past one in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. So then from here, do we just go through and we select yeah. our durance um, so, and just fill in some boxes, right? Yeah, so you fill in some boxes. Um, the things mm-hmm. which you'll need to go through are there's resistances, which you, which you take a note of. Um, there is whatever your refresh is, which is how you clear stress primarily, um, and your class skills and domains. There might be some equipment choices, um, but they're generally not too in depth, and then you like generally you'll, you'll note down your core abilities for your class, uh, and then we'll pick out our advances. So um, okay. rules is written. You get um, one. You get two low advances. Oh. Um, also, oh, I should also note um, we have a bunch of extra advances in the game, which are like like little prestige classes you can stick on to any other ca- to any character. Oh wow. Um, and you only like you don't need to have um, the the prereq requirements are they start on page sixty nine nice they start on page sixty nine <laughs> um, and they are um, you don't the prereqs are fictional rather than uh, mechanical so you don't have to have like strength sixteen or anything to get in um, so okay. the, the, there are a few interesting ones there like you could you could be like an ex city guard or you could you could worship the um, yawning hole of nihilism. In the middle of Spire, or you could um, eat people. That's one. Oh, private investigator. 
There's another one. They have they, they have the medium advance too drunk to care, which is quite nice. Ah. Which just which it just lets you take reputation and fallout to um to get rid of any other fallout, right? Which is nice. Um, but yes, um, I will. I think is it in the go... other book where you can like be filled with bees? Yes, that's uh, that's in that's in Black Magic. Um, okay. You can take the Deep Apiarist uh, yes. extra advance, which replaces all of your organs with bees. Ugh. Yeah, it's gross, but you do you do you do it to fight evil. I guess it, it it's makes for sense. A good cause. <laughs> <laughs> bees just for ma- a cause. <laughs> just made of bees. I think, si- seeing as I wrote the game, uh, I'm going to break the rules a little bit. <gasps> and I'm also I'm also going to give each of us a medium advance because I think it might be kind of fun to play with that. And seeing as we're not actually going to play these characters, that can sort of simulate the um, like th- two or three sessions. Very nice. Awesome. Hey, we can't argue with that. Um, so I was looking through the Durances, um, mm-hmm. and there's, there's quite a few here, um, but it also looks like you can choose not to have a Durance. Yeah, you can choose to have, um, somehow gone out of it. Like, you might bold come from move. a wealthy family. Sorry? I said it's a bold move. Mm. You can choose to <laughs> come from a wealthy family who, like, purchased your Durance and, and had you serve somewhere else, or you can... Um, have just been so so far off the radar that you were never picked up by the authorities. Interesting. Um, or you just yeah you you ran wild. There's no particularly sort of uh, huge in game ramifications. It's the sort of thing which if, if a player was interested in it, then we'd you know talk about it. Cool. But um, it's all it's all happened in the past. Very cool. Um, I think I have my durance, but uh, um, I want to wait. You doing? I want to wait because I want to see what everybody else is doing quick. I gotta go Before back that. to those. All right. As a bound, I get plus one to blood and plus two to shadow. And the idea is whatever your class is now is what you are doing after your durance, right? Yeah, pretty much so. Or okay. like um, definitely up, to, definitely recently. The durance, the durance kicks in about the age of, we're not, we just say when the, when the drow are, are of age. So imagining anywhere between 13 and 18. <laughs> right. So my core abilities as a knight uh, are pub crawler. So once a game, um, I can uh, I name a nearby bar, pub, or inn where the landlord knows me, but it isn't clear whether they like me or not. Oh. <laughs> I have the uh, law of the docks, which means I am legally allowed to carry a large bladed weapon um, because I am technically a police officer, but more actually a gangster. Interesting. Uh, and I have the pick a fight skill, and so once per once per situation, I can ask the GM. Um, who's the best person to pick a fight with if I want to A, win, B, make a good impression, or C, cause a distraction. And those are my core things. Oh, also, I'm a member of a knightly order. Oh, nice. And the thing about knightly orders is that they... Um, pretty much all of the knightly orders um, operate out of pubs, which share the name of the order, and pretty much all of the pubs have really saucy nicknames. Which we came up with. Oh, um, but this is a family podcast, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to consult your spire book for the sort of carry-on grade eyebrow waggling <laughs> raunch we put in there. Um, but yes, I, I'm a member uh, as a knight. I will have, I'll be a member of a knightly order slash pub, and I will be expected to effectively tend bar in there um, in exchange for them doing me favors and that sort of thing. But it's uh, oh, that's, nice. that's that's more up to the GM and again how, how much they want to make it happen. Okay. So I, I was looking at the uh, the core traits here on the bound, and I get the resistances, skills, and domains. Those are pretty self explanatory. But mm-hmm. what does it mean by refresh? Okay, so the the refresh is a and it's, it's kind of think of it like your class's core action. And okay. when you perform when you perform your refresh action, you'll refresh either d three, d six, or d eight stress, depending on how well you do it. Oh, by refresh that means you just clear it straight off your sheet. And okay. these are a way to sort of reward role playing and like reward the sort of role th- thing we want the class to do. So for the night, mine is engage in reckless success. Hmm. Uh, the bound. What, what's the bound? Uh, bring a criminal to justice. Nice. And the carrion priest. Uh, complete a hunt and take your quarry. Ooh. Oh, so yours overlap quite neatly there. Mm-hmm. I guess I could get drunk nearby. <laughs> we can celebrate afterwards. Yeah. Um, I guess you should have some sort of um, equipment choice. So, as far as the bound goes, if I can remember, you just choose whether your whether your weapon does more damage or whether you can hide it easier. 
Uh, either you have like a like a like a knife or a or, or a um, ch- uh, cleaver, or you have a big big axe. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Carrion Priest has um, some slightly more interesting choices to make, including the Prey Hook. Oh yeah, I totally <laughs> picked that one. The Knowledge nice. Prey Hook. It's stunning as well. So it's actually well OP. Nice. Um, the prey hook uh, can basically reduce anyone to, to. It can reduce the difficulty of anyone you're fighting to zero, and oh, it only wow. goes up to two. <laughs> so um, it's very good if you're fighting uh, elite elite guards, that sort of thing. Oh, that's really cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to be picking the god knife for my uh, my weapon. Okay. I oh. like the core abilities of the carrion priest because I have a hyena companion. Oh, and that's nice. very important to me to have an animal friend, um, because there's nothing GMs hate more than animal friends, at least in my experience. I maybe have just had GMs who are like only small animals, because <laughs> I did have a game where I had a lion. That's um, that's a very special friend, right? Well, you and you can't take your lion into the tea house, like they well, don't like that. It depends um, on the tea house, but yeah. Well, and I mean, who's going to tell that lion no? Like you, you look him in the eye and say no. <laughs> uh, so I'm pretty excited. I'm gonna have this hyena. Cool. And then um, a lay of the land, which is being a trained hunter. Um, so you can name up to three features or opportunities that your allies can take advantage of, which is super useful. Nice. Mm, it is really. Nice. It also gives you. It gives. From from a game design point of view, it lets give whoever's playing the carrion priest get to sort of star in the combat scene a little bit or like, or, or, or to give them some more authority over framing the scene you'd be surprised at how many explosive barrels there are in Spire despite it being uh, just just an industrial society they just they have a lot of explosive red barrels you gotta have those laying around might as well yeah for sure awesome uh, never I, know I've chosen uh, so my my equipment I can choose I can get a great sword a knightly lance um, which is which we put in as a joke because it's funny to see someone use a lance when they're not on a horse, oh. and a sword and pistol, uh, a grackler pistol. All of our oh. m- most of our guns are named after birds because I think birds have cool names. Um, <laughs> and so I have I have chosen the sword and grackler pistol, which is nice. high damage, but you only get one shot with it because it's old. Very cool. Yeah, and my core abilities are surprise infiltration. So nothing can keep you out once per session. Insert yourself into a situation where you are not currently present. So long as there's some conceivable way you could get in there. That's that's really interesting. It's just if there's a scene in the game and you're like, I think I want to be there. Yeah, you kind of can. The GM has one... to get really careful not to have NPCs talk to each other about their <laughs> wicked plans, and the bound just like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was in the drafters all along. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Is that once per session? Once yeah, per once session, session, yep. Okay. So you don't want to use it to just like creepily pop up behind people. Right. Which is most totally pe- most what people I would do. use for. Yeah, most people just use it for that, and that's a fair use. You might as well. Turn around in the swivel chair. <laughs> I've been here the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but I was sitting in that chair. Yes, you were. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the product can be found in the show notes. Also, check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us, 
And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like Design Doc. Join hosts Hannah Schaefer and Evan Rowland as they redesign a role playing game. Design Doc is an experiment in public participatory analog game design. It's fun, it's messy. And you're invited along for the ride.